that you have made whatever comes i won't complain for all my hope is in your name and now your joy awaits my praise i give thanks for all you Set my feet on higher ground. So here I stand. You are my God. Your faithfulness, my solid rock. I give thanks for all you have done. And I will sing of your mercy and your love. Your love is unfailing. Lord, I
lift your hands. Come on, declare that. Declare that today. Come on, let's, let's sing this chorus. Around the world, I don't care wherever you go, this chorus works. Hallelujah. said to have gratitude and not give it to be thankful and not express it it's like buying a gift wrapping a gift and never giving it away hello wouldn't that be foolish to buy a gift wrap a gift oh I got something for you but I'm not giving it to you come on how many of the sins we ought to be and we are grateful people right so this is what I want you to I want you to find two people I love gratitude walks. Let me tell you, I do, I do a walk, gratitude walk every day. Because here's what I know. You cannot be grateful and complain at the same time. Hello. I'm, I'm not even preaching today. I'm just giving it to you. You, you cannot be grateful 
and complain. And every day I do a gratitude walk. I just, I just tell God things that I'm grateful for. I want you to find two people and tell them one thing that you're grateful for. Come on, we're going to do it. Come on, just keep worshiping, keep playing. Come on. Hallelujah. minutes we just want to welcome all of our campuses that's joining us thank you so much for joining us Westville, uh, North Judson Wanata, Hebron over in NPH campus all of our online campus wherever you're watching from I know we got some already starting to travel this week for Thanksgiving maybe you're in and you're a guest today you're traveling hey we're so glad that you are here here's what I'd love to do I'd love to connect with you let you know some things that's happening going on. There's a little thanks for joining us card right in the seat in front of you. Or you can grab your phone. There's a QR code right there. And you can just log on and you can give us some information. I promise you we're not trying to bother you. We want to get something to you, not trying to get something from you. And if you'll help us do that, man, we'll let you know some things happening. Even if you're out of state, you can keep up with some things that's going on at Heartland. Hey, one of the things that's happening here in just a couple of weeks, on December the 6th, on Friday night, we have our second annual Chris Sunshine Center Christmas Choir. Man, we're excited. These are kids from our Sunshine Center group. These are adults. Some of them are adults. They, they all have some type of different uh, disability. And they're going to give us about a 45-minute uh, Christmas good feeling, I guarantee you. And we invite you to come. It's a free event. Yeah, come on, give the Lord a good hand clap. Some of these kids are already practicing. Uh, Pastor Lindsay, worship team's working with some stuff. And uh, it's a free event. We want you to pop in. We are going to have a, a cookie. What is what's, what? A cookie bar. Man, that sounds delicious right there, doesn't it? A cookie bar. And uh, it's a free event. Just come on out. Support these kids on that Friday night. And then in December, we start our Good News series on December the 15th. We have a little slide there. Good news. We're going to be talking about that on that Sunday morning. That will kind of be our Christmas uh, forte. And uh, this is a great time of the year to invite people to come and join us then on December the 15th. So next month, this is going to be exciting. But can you believe this year is almost gone? I mean, 2025 is a right around the corner. And, uh, man, God just done some amazing things. You know, the last few weeks, many of you were planning on your one-day offering. And uh, we challenge you to work a day's wage for Convoy of Hope. Listen, in the last two months, Convoy through North Carolina and East Tennessee and Florida, over 200 trucks that they sent with food and water supplies, over 600,000 men and women have been ministered to, prayed for. They've been given resources during the disaster. And we had a goal of $40,000. Now, I had a few people say, Pastor Phil, are you sure that should be our goal? I mean, that's, that's a lot of money, people, Christmas, and I said, listen, I just feel like God wants this church to just start flowing in generosity. We talked a little bit last week about grace-filled generosity. What does it look like in the blessings of God? You know, our kids on all of our campuses, they were involved. In, do you know they raised over $2,000? Come on, our children, give it up. So you know what this church raised in our one-day offering that we took up last week? Come on, give me a good drum roll. Come on, come on, come on, come on. What is it? $61,000. Woo! 
come on. That's, listen, that was possible because everybody participated and did something. We had some first-time givers in this convo of hope. They said, you know what, Pastor? I want to start being at least consistent in my stewardship. And thank you, thank you, thank you for what you're doing. This is going to be an amazing gift that, that Convo of Hope is going to continue to use. It gets multiplied. That number gets multiplied. And it's just amazing the generosity that's coming out of this church. So thank you so very much for doing that. And just, I, I'm telling you, I'm excited about what God's doing in our church, how he's moving us towards generosity of understanding Everything that God gives us is meant to flow through us. You understand? None of us are supposed to be ponds or, you know, we're, we're not supposed to be reservoirs where we hold on. Everything, every blessing comes in my life, in your life, is about how can I pass it on? What can I do to steward my time, my talent, my temple, my testimony, and yes, even my treasure. So thank you so very sick. That's our biggest offering for Convoy of Hope. So next year, we I got to have a bigger goal, I guess. I just didn't challenge you enough. Amen. Hey, I want you to stand with me, and we're going to receive our tithes and offerings today. Hey, today is Mission Sunday, and all these flags you see flying and uh, at our Valpo campus, some of you other campuses, we have some flags up. We have missionaries around the walls over at our Hebron campus and down at North Johnson. All these missionaries, I just challenge you. You know, when you walk in, I know sometimes you walk in, you start talking. Please look at these flags. Take just a minute and pray for missionaries that we have serving in these countries, these nations. We just picked up a new, a new missionary over in the Europe area. They're going to be doing ministry, Steve and his family, to families with disabilities over. Because you do understand that that's not a northwest Indiana problem, right? Come on. That's not a northwest Indiana issue. It's not a northwest Indiana opportunity to be able to touch the lives of families that have children with disabilities. And we just picked up a new missionary and, uh, man, so just pray for these missionaries. And I challenge you, some of you, you give every month. You have a, you have a, a, a specific offering that you set aside. Thank you for doing that. Beyond your tithe, your giving, your stewarding, God will richly bless you for all that you do in his kingdom today. Amen. There's a lot that God has in our account. You know, there's a lot of things that God has put already in our account because we're Christians. But what, listen, it's not at our disposal or become part of our resources because we haven't tapped into it yet. I, I guarantee you today in this house, if you were to say, God, everything that you have in my account today, Pastor Nat's going to be talking about graceful joy. Listen, it's already in your account. We just say, God, help me tap into it. Let it become part of my resource today in my life. Your stewardship is so important. Thank you for doing that. Let me pray a blessing. If you've already given online, there's a little card like this that says, I gave. You can just drop that card in there because we want to bless you at all of our campuses. Father, just thank you so much for what you're doing at our church. Thank you for tremendous generosity that's flowing through our people. And God, we just pray blessings upon blessings upon blessings upon every man, woman, boy, and girl today as we steward what little we have or what much that we have. Father, we understand, God, that you will challenge us out of what we have, not what we don't have. And God, I thank you that our people are being resourceful. I thank you that are, they're full of generosity, and that generosity is overflowing even in our stewarding, our treasure today, and our time and our temple, and we thank you for it today. Let your blessings flow in Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. Amen. Hey, worship this morning. The ushers are going to pass the offering buckets through the auditorium up in the mezzanine. Thank you so much. Campuses, you worship, and then we're coming back with the message today. God bless you. If you don't let go of tomorrow 
Cause it ain't even faith if your plan falls apart, but you still choose to follow. Even if it doesn't make sense now, it will when it's over. Say there will be joy. There will be joy in the morning. Giving in to your feelings is like drowning in the shallows. Oh, you gotta keep believing, even in the middle of the unknown. Cause your grace will be there when you come to the end of your road, then you let go. If it feel like you're going down, but the story isn't over, cause there will be joy in the morning. There will be joy. not good, then he's not done. This morning, I want to talk to you as we continue our, our, our series this morning. You can stand with me as we read our scripture in First Peter. We've been in this series, Grace-Filled Life, and, and this morning I want to talk to you about grace-filled joy. First Peter chapter 3 is where we're going to go this morning, verse 3 through 9. I might just stop in verse 6. We'll see where I stop. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable. I love it. It's imperishable, undefiled, unfader, unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power, whose power? Whose power? who by God's power, listen to what he says, are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. And he says this, in this, everybody say in this. In what? In everything he just described. In this you rejoice. One translation says, in this you have joy. Though now, for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Can we pray this morning? God, I thank you, Lord, for your goodness. God, I thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy. Thank you, Lord, for your son, Jesus, who died on the cross for our sins. And because of him, we can come into your presence this morning. 
And God, I pray over every person in this place at every location today that, God, you would open our eyes, our ears, our hearts, our minds to what it is you have to say to us in this place. God, let us leave different than how we were when we walked in. Challenge and change every one of us. In Jesus' mighty name, amen, 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 and amen. Come on, can you put your hands together for Jesus? One time this morning. Thank you, worship team. You may be seated this morning here at Valpo. I want to welcome all of you today. Welcome our guests. So good to see you this morning. We'd love to connect with you if we haven't yet after service. We don't take it lightly that you are here with us this morning. And uh, we welcome our other locations at North Judson and Hebron and Westville and Wanata and those watching online. Come on, can you put your hands together? Let them know you're here. Let them know you're awake. We all look good today before we put on the pre-turkey five, six, seven pounds that's coming this week, right? And uh, yeah, amen, that's what I'm talking about. And so good to see all of you today. As we kind of end up this series, we've been talking about grace-filled life and, and living out. We talked last week, grace-filled generosity, $61,000, y'all, giving the Convoy of Hope. That's amazing, over 61000 to help feed the kids around the, this world. And that, man, that, just, that is just amazing. And uh, this morning, I want to continue as we, as we end this series. I want to talk about grace-filled joy. And the title of my message is, In Spite of Circumstances. In Spite of Circumstances. I don't know if you've ever had one of those days where you've woken up in the morning time and you immediately realized it was going to be a bad day. Anybody ever had one of those days? Come on. Yeah. Right? I don't know how it starts off for you, and maybe it's different things. I know there's been, like, we have a lot of animals in my house. Even though I don't want animals in my house, we have animals in my house. We have cats and dogs. And so, like, for me, it's very, it's very, it's, it's one of those mornings that I will wake up and I step, like, in cat puke in the middle of the floor. Yeah, exactly. Immediately, I know this day's over. Like, I might as well just go on back to bed and not even start. I have a very weak stomach, and it is just over when that happens. And, uh. But maybe it's something like that for you, right, that, uh, I mean, you know, maybe you, you know it's going to be a bad day when you turn on the morning news and they're displaying nothing but emergency routes of how to get out of the city. You know it's going to be a bad day if that's what you're seeing, right? Uh, you, you know it's, it's going to be a bad day if you wake up in the morning and, and the sun is rising from the west. That's going to be a, the sun rises in the east, y'all, in case you come and wake up. Keep up with me this morning. It's, it's, it's going to be it's going to be a, a bad day. You know it's going to be a bad day when you walk into work and your boss calls you in to, for the office and says, "Don't even worry about taking your jacket off. We got to have a conversation." It's probably going to be a bad day. Uh, it, it's going to be a bad day. This is for all my biker friends. It's going to be a bad day when your horn gets stuck following a group of hell's angels. It's going to be a bad day for you. For sure, as you're going down the road. Uh, for all my more seasoned people in life, it's going to be a da bad day when you wake up in the morning and your dentures are locked together. It's going to be, if, if you're not older, we don't think that's funny, but see, they did. Uh, it's going to be a bad day for you when you call your own answering service and they tell you it's none of your business. It's going to be a bad day. We all have those moments in life, and we've all had bad days. Okay, great, five of you. Let me talk to this side of the room. We've all had bad days before. Come on, amen. We've all had bad days. The rest of y'all are really saved over here. Y'all don't have bad days, but we know what it's like to have bad days. And, and listen, this morning, I, I want to understand and talk on this topic because we all get discouraged. But today I want to talk to you about how do we live this grace-filled joy? Because I know in my own life, I am not so naive to think that we will always be on top of the world walking on the mountain. There are moments in our life where we will surely be traveling down in the valley. Amen? Amen. Like, like I was telling the first service, for the last 20 years, Melvin, I've been trying to figure out why the Lord has allowed me to live in northwest Indiana and become a Chicago Bears fan. It made no sense to me. The heartache, the roller coaster of emotions. Yeah, you know, exactly. Amen. I like... I mean, if, if they can find a way to lose the game, think about it, they find a way to lose the game. And for the last 20 years, I'm just like, why, Lord, am I, or why is your servant suffering so hard through 
NFL football. And now, though, I've come to understand this is how loving my Heavenly Father is, is he's prepared me for the last 20 years just to experience what I'm experiencing this year in Alabama football because it is painful like what I am seeing on the field. Don't laugh too hard about that. Y'all hate on Alabama too much. All right? And uh, we all have those moments, though. Right, we laugh, it's about sports, but 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 if we're honest, we all have these these moments in our life that we we would love, oh, I would love to, I would love it if our life through Christ is just built and lived on going from glory to glory, from mountaintop to mountaintop. But I know in order to get to the next mountaintop, many times we gotta also go through a valley. And neither am I so spiritually ignorant though to understand and, and to not be aware though that. The good news is that God has provided us for those times during our difficult experiences. That, that God has provided something for us because, because this is what Jesus said. Jesus says, in life, not you might, not you should think about it, in life you will have tribulation. In life you will have trials. In, in life you're going to have difficulties. In life you're going to have Trouble, you're going to have circumstances and situations. There's going to be a real enemy who seeks to steal, kill, and destroy. In life, you will have all of those things. But he said this, but take heart. Why? Because I have overcome the world. I have overcome those difficult times, those difficult scenarios, and those difficult situations. And for you and I, we must understand that the thing that God has provided for us during the hard times more than other is this word, joy. Joy is such a short word and yet so powerful. Webster, our friend Webster defines joy as this. I got it in your notes. It says, it is the emotion evoked by well-being, success or good fortune, or by the prospect of possessing what one desires. This emotion evoked by well-being. One, one translation and one writer says that joy is this strong feeling of happiness, a manifestation of happiness through an outward rejoicing or excitement. And for those who don't know Christ as their Savior, for those who don't have God in their life to those people, maybe it's you this morning and you've never made that decision to surrender to God yet, but to those people who don't know Jesus, that definition may definitely be true. That definition that, that means the emotion evoked by well-being, success, that is the definition that we often live by. But to the Christian, to the Christ follower, to those who know God and, and have a personal relationship with him through Jesus Christ, something different applies when it relates to joy. We'll write it down. I'll put it in your notes. Let, let me say it like this. Worldly joy is often outwardly based. Heavenly joy is inwardly based. Worldly joy is something that happens like Webster defines that when things are going well, I'm happy. When my marriage is good, I'm happy. When my kids are acting right, I'm happy. When I've got enough money in the bank to pay the bills, I'm happy. When nothing is going on in my life and those circumstances seem too difficult, that is worldly joy. I am happy, but, but something is different to the Christ follower. We can look and say, in spite of my circumstances... In spite of my situations, in, in spite of trials and tribulations and difficulties, in spite of an enemy that may be attacking, I've still got joy. Why? Because it is not determined by my outward circumstances, but it is something on the inside that has already been placed there. Something on the inside that I already have that no matter what happens on the outside, it cannot touch what is on the inside. Amen. That is joy. For the Christ follower, this is, this is the joy that Apostle Paul writes about. And, and in 1 Peter, he, as he pins these words, he's, he's writing to the church in, in Asia Minor. If I could give you a little historical background, he's writing to the church in Asia Minor that is experiencing some difficulties. They're ex experiencing some persecution. They're, they're likely, it's even some state-sponsored things that are happening because they're refusing to pay tribute to Caesars. And, and some, some say that the Apostle Paul is writing this letter from, from Rome, which in his own right is experiencing, the church in Rome at this time is experiencing intense persecution by Nero. So, so Paul is, is writing to the church saying, listen, I, I know you are going through some 
difficult situations. We know what it is like here. And matter of fact, there's, there's even worse coming. But he writes these words as, as a reminder and, and as a proclamation to encourage that there's something greater that, that we have access to that is determined just by outward experiences. And he writes about this joy that remains true in the face of suffering. And, and, and Paul writes about, uh, again, to, to hear me this morning, to, to cause us to take our attention. And he writes to them to cause us to take our attention and to not dwell on what the world looks like from their point of view, but to see it from what it looks like from God's point of view. Yes. To, to remind them that God is still in control. And to look at the circumstances and the situation from God's viewpoint. And, and, and he gives us four things this morning that I want to walk you through. Four, four reasons that we can have this grace-filled joy. And he tells us in 1 Peter 1 and 3, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy, mercy hath begotten us again. One translation says has bought us again. One translation says has, has purchased us once again. Another translation says has redeemed us once again. And so he starts off by reminding us this morning that, that our joy starts, we can have this grace-filled joy because we are born again. Isaiah 12 and 2 says it like this, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He has also become my salvation. I, I think that, that Christians should be some of the most joyful people to be around. All right, only five of y'all got said amen to that. So maybe you need a witness is for you today. I, I think Christ followers should be some of the most happiest and the most joyful people to be around. Because for a Christ follower, this is the start of our joy. Our joy, our outward joy comes from the satisfaction that I know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. So watch this. When I understand that, hear me this morning. This is where Paul's starting us out. This is the starting point. When I understand that, watch this. My joy is not a defiance of reality, but it's a declaration of who Jesus is. As a Christ follower, my joy is not based upon me sticking my head in the sand and acting like things aren't going wrong. That's not joy. That's ignorance. Right? That's stupidity. That's what that is. My joy is not a defiance of reality or a denial of reality. My joy, the start of my joy, what brings me joy is my salvation. Is that when you and I have salvation, when we're walking in God's word, we're blessed by God. I have joy. Thank God that because he loved me so much, he sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross for my sins. And if he does nothing else for me, the mere fact that he loved me enough to do that, 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 that gives me enough joy. Thank God that I didn't know how to get to him. I didn't know how to enter into his presence. I wasn't worthy of his love and his goodness and his grace and his mercy. But he sent Jesus Christ to this earth to die and pay the price for my sins. And now because I have access to him, I'm considered an heir. I'm considered royalty. I'm now his son and you're now his daughter. I'm not the tail. I'm the head. And I have access to a God who is all powerful. I have access to a God who has everything that I need and that's where my joy starts Amen. it starts in salvation my joy doesn't come from a new car because that wears off. My joy doesn't come from more money because I don't know about you. I spend it too much. My joy doesn't come from a new house or a new job or a new pair of shoes. But I rejoice and my joy comes because I know my name is written down in the Lamb's book of life. And I have a heavenly father. And one day I'm going to get a heavenly inheritance. And I have access to everything that he has for me. What brings me joy? It's when I think of God's goodness. What brings me joy when I think of God's love? What brings me joy when I think of God's salvation? What brings me joy is when I think of God's mercy. What brings me joy is when I think of God's provision over my life. That's when I have joy. Because I have access. Because I'm saved. You, you, you want to see the biggest revival on your campus, students, you want to see the biggest revival at your workplace? Start being the happiest people to be around. It happened last Sunday. I won't embarrass her, but, but Miss Kathy shared an amazing story. God, 
Y'all been hearing things that are happening in our student ministry and Pastor Cody and Pastor John and, and the team of what God's been doing. They've been sharing with a bunch of people. And, we, man, we've just been having students come. And, and y'all heard, y'all saw Maisie, this young lady. Maisie came, and she got baptized with her friend Brooklyn a few Sundays ago. And then, and then Maisie started bringing Donovan, and Donovan has been coming now. And they're here today. I'm not going to embarrass them and point them out, but they're here today with their mom, Kathy. Matter of fact, their grandparents are now here today because I met them today. And, and Miss Kathy said, yeah, you can clap. That's amazing. And Miss Kathy, don't get mad because I didn't ask your permission to tell this story. But Miss Kathy said this. Last Sunday, we're sitting in our pastor's hour, and we like to go around, and we like to share, uh, you know, hey, how did you hear about Heartland? How long have you been coming? And sometimes it's people who are brand new. Sometimes it's people who've been here for a while, and now they're, you know, wanting to get involved. And Miss Kathy said, I'll be honest. My son started coming, and I started seeing a difference in him and his joy and his happiness and his demeanor. And she was like, I just got to go see what's going on at this church because something different about my son. And listen, we're like, oh, that's amazing. Shouldn't that happen every day for the Christ follower? Like, shouldn't that be we walk into work? Shouldn't that be we walk into our school? Shouldn't that be we drive into our neighborhood? And I'm not saying that we're perfect, and I'm not saying that we got all the answers, but people look at us and say, I don't know what it is. I don't know how you got it. I don't know where it came from, but there's something different about you. And whatever it is that you have, that's what I want. Grace-filled joy. Grace-filled joy, it happens, he says, it starts because we are born again. Now, if you're not born again, if you haven't accepted Christ, you haven't started really understanding what joy is all about. But he says, when you step into relationship, and then he goes on in 1 Peter 1 and 3, watch what he says. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again. Now, watch what he says. I love this. Underline it in your Bibles. Underline it in your notes. He's begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. This lively hope. It's this hope of living again. It's this hope that there's more than just what we see, that life is not all there is. It's this lively hope that there's a place called heaven. And I don't know about you, I'm planning on going there one day. And I hope you are too. I told the first service, my hope and my desire is that Heartland has like this big block in heaven. And like, and I hope we're one of the noisiest blocks. And people are like, what's going on over there? Like, that's the crazy Heartland people. Don't even go over there. They're just loud. And they, they, got, they, got, they, got, they got people of all nations and they got people of all backgrounds. And when they get together, they just, they're so loud. Don't even go bother. Like, that's my hope is to have the biggest party in heaven. And this is the hope that he's talking about, this lively hope. One writer said it like this. I love this def definition. That biblical hope is a positive attitude based on a desired expectation and includes, I love this word, certainty. It's not a wish. It's not a pipe dream. It's not a maybe this will happen according to you want to write it down and read it this week, according to Romans 5 and 5 and Romans um, 8, 24 and 25. This is a, it's a, it's a hope of, of certainty. And what the Apostle Paul is reminding us is not only can we have joy because of our salvation, but we have joy because of this lively hope. It's not a dead hope. It's not a wish. Now, he writes this particular part because he's, he's addressing some theological issues that are going on in the church at that time. Because some have begun to kind of live this life and they've kind of preach this message that, that maybe the resurrection is not true. Maybe when you die, you're dead and that's it. And, and they were having this theology of like, well, even if that is true, then, then so what? Then no big deal. I, I lived my life as a Christian and it was a pretty good life and I did the best that I could, and if it ends when I go in the ground, then, then no big deal. I was a good person while I was here on, on the earth. And the Apostle Paul says, no, that's not true. Like, 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 he says, that is, that is not the reason, that is not the hope that we have. Jesus did not die and, and shed his blood just so we could be a good person. Jesus died and shed his blood so we could be dead, so those that were dead could come alive. Not just here on this earth, but in eternity, that, that we have access to something that is greater 
for, for Apostle Paul, he was telling us that salvation, hear me this morning, is a pre- present reality, yes, uh, that it's experienced through, through new birth. But, but salvation is not only just reality here, but it's also for the after. That it's also something that is, that is going to happen. It is this hope that you and I have that, that in spite of life. It is this hope that you and I have that in spite of difficulties. It is this hope that you and I have that, that, that can cause someone. What can cause someone? I have seen it with my own eyes that they get the phone call from the doctor and they say, I'm sorry, we've done all we can, and there's nothing else we can do. And they can sit there on that bed or lay there on that bed or sit on that recliner in that living room. And as they can pass on to the other side, they can do it with peace and with a smile. They can say with the words that we've read, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And now I'm going to an inheritance. There's this lively hope that we have that, that one day God will right all of the wrongs. And he will make everything good. Again, there will be this place where there will be no crying. There will be no pain. There will be no death. It is this hope that you and I have. He said, this is the joy that you and I can latch on to. This is the joy that we have as Christ followers. That there's more than just what we experience on this earth. That there's more to than what we experience in this pain. Because maybe you've come in this place and you say, Pastor Matt, I don't have no joy because of how life is. Paul says there's more than just what we're going through right now. He says, watch this. And then he goes on in 1 Peter 1 and 4. He says, not only can we have hope or have joy because of we're born again, not only because we have this lively hope, but oh, I love this. He says, because of our inheritance. Oh, I love it. He says to an inheritance now, he's going to describe the inheritance that we have access to. This hope. It's not a wish. It's a guarantee that we're going to have to an inheritance that is incorruptible, that's undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. That's our inheritance. That's why I can have grace-filled joy. Is that not only do I have a relationship with Christ on this earth, but I have this hope now, but also for the next, that that, that it doesn't just end here, that there's more than just to what sees the eyes here. And, and, but when it comes to that inheritance, it's a promise that God has. And he uses these words, write it down. He says, our inheritance in heaven is as corru- incorruptible as God. What does that mean? It means that it is not liable to, to corrosion or corruption or decay. Just like God is imperishable, your inheritance is imperishable as well. There's nothing that can be done to it. There's nothing that can cause it to waste away. He says, then he uses another word, our inheritance is heaven, is as undefiled as God. What does that mean? That means just as God is. He's describing our inheritance, that it is free from that which by nature of a thing can deform it or debase it or impair it. It can't happen to our inheritance. It can't be deformed. It can't be impaired. It can't be debased. Then he goes on and he says, if that's not good enough, our inheritance in heaven is as unfading as God. I like this one. That our inheritance, and he uses this word that, that really describes a, a certain flower that he was describing. And, and this word is taken from the name flower. And I'm not even going to try to say the name of the flower because I will mess that up like crazy. But uh, the Greek word that is brought from the name of this flower, is, it is a flower that already always comes back. That it, it may be covered by snow, it may be covered by, by a storm, it may be covered by debris, but always the following season, it always comes back, and it comes back stronger and more beautiful than the next year. And this is what he's saying, our inheritance in life, oftentimes this is what life does, it, it will make us feel covered by, and weighed down. And, and, and there will be debris covering what we see in our eyes, but he says there's this inheritance that, that even though in this life, feels covered, one day you will get it and it will always be there. And it's going to be waiting on you. And then he says that our inheritance in heaven, I love it, is reserved for us. Well, what does that mean? This means that God personally, oh, I love this, the creator of the universe, the one who spoke light from nothing, the one who created 
everything from nothing. That God. That that God personally attends to our inheritance carefully. Now, I don't know about you. I've never got an inheritance before. Right? Okay, yeah, there you go. Uh, I don't really plan on getting one anytime soon. Right? But, but I don't know if you've ever seen, right, I, I, as a pastor, we do funerals. And have you ever been around those funerals? Sometimes it's sad to see what happens, that, that maybe there is an inheritance that is there, and it gets left for the family, and the family mismanages the inheritance. Have you ever seen it before? And then they get angry about it. Well, they're going to misspend the inheritance, and they're going to misuse the inheritance, and they're going to abuse the inheritance, and, and it gets mismanaged, and the inheritance that was maybe a lot of money or a lot of things or a great inheritance because it got mismanaged, like it soon disappeared. You ever seen it before? I have. But what he is saying here, watch this, is that God personally, it means that he personally takes care of our inheritance. And I don't know about you, but when I read the word, God doesn't mismanage anything. God, God knows how to handle his business. God is in a, a, a good business, and his business does well. And God doesn't mismanage. He takes upon himself. Listen, Jesus said it in John 14, 1 through 3. What did he say? He said, let not your heart be troubled. He says, because if you believe in God and also in me, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have not told you. And I go to prepare a place for you. He says, and if I go to prepare it, guess what? I'm going to come again so I can get you and take you to it. Listen, for you and I this morning, you and I can have this joy because we understand that there is an inheritance waiting for us on the other side of this life that is not wasting away, that is not going away, that every time we sow seed into the kingdom of God here, that we're laying up an inheritance there that is going to be greater, that is going to be more magnificent, that will be worth every trial, every tribulation, every, every struggle that we went through, that when we get there on the other side, just one minute, just one moment in his presence, as we experience everything that he has for us, it will be worth it all on this earth. That's our inheritance. When we get saved, we become rich, and riches found only in Jesus. When you and I come to Christ, we have access to God. We have access to his riches, to his supply. Philippians 4.19 means something totally different when we get that. When Philippians says, but my God shall supply my needs according to whose riches? His riches in glory. It's this inheritance that we have available. It's this inheritance that is our birthright. And this is what I love, and this is where I will land today. He says, you and I can have a joy-filled, a grace-filled joy life in spite of circumstances because we are kept by the power of God. This is where my joy comes from. He says in 1 Peter 1, 5, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. If I had time this morning, I could preach a whole message on God's keeping power. And, and, and if, if our joy this morning was based upon our power, oh, we'd be in a lot of trouble. If my joy this morning was based upon what I can do in my own life, if it was based upon what I have access to in my own power, if it was based upon what I can produce out of my own self, it would be looking pretty down. But the Apostle Paul tells us this morning, you and I can have this, this grace-filled joy life because we are kept by the power of God. It's one of the most beautiful things about our salvation. That yes, you see, we are, we are saved by grace through faith. God initiates the salvation. God initiated that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son Whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He initiated the, the salvation by offering Jesus Christ, his son, as the sacrificial lamb, punishable. And he took the punishment that you and I should have taken. God started the process of, uh, of salvation. He, he initiated it. And it's his spirit that seals it. But, but it, is, uh, it is salvation of grace from God that happens through faith, which means he started it and he initiated it. The Holy Spirit seals it. But at some point, we have to take a step to it. It's a gift. It's free. 
cannot earn it. There is nothing we can do to gain access to it other than just accept it, take a step towards God. And so we do that in our in our own strength. We do that in our own power. We do that coming to a place of saying, God, I su- surrender my life. It is that initial step. But the good news is, is after that, it's not up to us anymore. I don't have to work hard to keep it. I don't have to work hard to gain God's love. I don't have to work hard. Do I disciple myself? Do I train myself? Do I get in God's word? And does his Holy Spirit begin to work in me and change the way I think and I act and I talk and I live and I forgive? All of that, yes, 1,000%. But there's nothing in my own power that I do to, to earn it and to go after. What happens after that initial decision? It is then up to God that I am kept by his power, not my own power. I know why I still miss it this morning. God, God does all of it. He does the saving, and he also does the keeping. Say amen if you're glad of that. Okay, I get it. Okay, Pastor Matt, I, I, I can have joy because, because of salvation, and I have joy because of this inheritance. I have joy because of this hope, and, and I can have joy because it's God's power keeping me, but it just don't feel right. Because here, here's my question. If, if God's got it, because here's the good news. And now watch, this is what he just tells us. He says it starts with our salvation. We have joy through salvation because of our relationship with Jesus Christ. We have joy because of this living hope. We have joy because of this inheritance. We have joy because of his keeping power in our life. So the good news is this. If he's got it, then I can't lose it. And the devil can't steal it. If he's the one who controls it, then there's nothing I can do to lose it. And there's surely nothing that the devil can do to take it. The devil can't take my joy. I can't lose my joy. Why? He just showed us because God is, he has the keeping power. God is the one that is keeping my joy. He is the one that is keeping my salvation. He is the one that is keeping my peace. My peace. So if he's got it, I can't lose it and the devil can't steal it. That's good news. But this is what happened. I don't know about you. This is how I think. Well, if I can't lose it and the devil can't steal it, then why do I feel like I don't have it? Come on. Y'all, y'all being so super saved this morning, like y'all got everything put together. Be honest. Okay, Pastor Matt, I walked in this morning and you just told me he's got it. I can't lose it, and the devil can't steal it. I don't feel pretty joyful today. I don't feel he's got my peace. I can't lose my peace. The devil can't steal my peace. You you should have been with me all week because I haven't had peace at all in my mind. Come on, on, let's be real this morning. Right? What what, what happens then? Have you ever seen, I I got a picture for you. You ever seen those those, those shows that, uh, like, they go find, like, an old rusty car somewhere? I don't even know what kind of car it is. I just they pulled me a picture of a car. Who's a car person? Anybody know what that is? Is it a Chevy? All right, there you go. That's a Chevy. And and, and and I love like you've ever seen those shows. They go to old houses and they go to antiques. And I like watching the cars. I know nothing, y'all. Nothing. Why do I like watching cars? Because I know so much. Nope. Know nothing about cars. I know how to gas them up. I know how to put air in the tire. That's about all I got. I don't know what a fuel filter is. I don't know where to find it. Air filter, I don't know what that is. Carburetor, I, I don't even know my car's got one. I don't know, right? That's what I, my, my, my knowledge of vehicles is amazing. But I love, they, they will go find this vehicle. Have you ever seen it? And they go and they see it and, and it looks something like this. I've seen them even worse. No, 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 go back to the other one. Go back to the other one. And they'll, they'll look at the car like this and I look at it. Isn't it beautiful? And I'm like, no, that's God awful. Why are we even looking at this vehicle? Like weeds are all in it. Right, animals have got up in the interior and ravaged it, and they're like there's like, like a raccoon home in the back seat. God knows only what's been happening in the back seat with the raccoon family, right? Stuff's everywhere, and, and, and rust and weeds are will be all up grown up in the engine. They're like, man, this thing is beautiful. When we get and they'll pull it out, put it on a trailer, and I'm like, why are they doing a stupid show about this vehicle? And now what do they do? They go up in the shop, they get a sandblaster, boom, they begin to get away the. The, 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 all of the rust, 
They'll pull out the weeds. They'll, they'll rip out all the interior. They'll shampoo it. They'll reupholster it. And then, like, by the end of the show, it comes out. Now, give them the other picture. And it looks something like that. Now, that's a nice looking car. I don't know nothing about that car, but I'll roll in that car for sure. That's a Cadillac. That's a different car. That's a beautiful car. That same car as a Cadillac. Look, somebody's schooling me right now in the middle of my message on, on my cars. But that's a beautiful car. I even like the color. They didn't even, they didn't even know that for sure, but they just picked me a random car. I love blue. I, I would love that vehicle. And, and I watched that process. And what is that process called? Thank you. What is that process called? It's called the restoration process. So hear me this morning. Maybe, maybe it could just be that we came in this place. Now listen, okay, if God's keeping it, I can't lose it, and the devil can't steal it, then why do I feel like I don't have it? It's because maybe life is choking it out right now. We've allowed the weeds of life. We've been weathered by the storms and we're rusted. And we've allowed all of these things, and the beauty is still there, but we just don't see it. But when we put it in the right hands of someone. Well, what am I trying to say to you this morning? Maybe, maybe the beauty wasn't missing, it was just masked by life. Maybe my joy isn't missing this morning, it's just been masked by life. Maybe my peace is not missing this morning, it's just been masked. Because God's keeping it, I can't lose it, the devil can't steal it, but life will choke it out. Life will cause the trials and the tribulations and the storms. But listen, if you and I come to a place in our life and we surrender to God and say, God, I'm going to give you back my joy that you already have. And God, I need you to restore it. God, I'm going to surrender my life to you. And that peace that you have, I'm going to need you to restore it. That's why Psalm 51 and 12, it says what? Restore unto me what? The joy of my salvation. That when my life comes back to him and he takes out his spiritual sandblaster and he takes out the spiritual things that the Holy Spirit does and begins to remove the weeds and begin to remove the thing, the joy begins to be uncovered. The joy begins to be unmasked. The peace begins to be unmasked. Why? When I surrender my life to my God who has the power to do it all. In spite of circumstances, I can be full of joy. In spite of trials, what can happen? I can be full of joy. And how crazy, how crazy would it be if halfway through that process, they didn't even finish the vehicle. They rolled the vehicle out at the end of the show, and it was still rusted, and the interior was halfway done. How crazy would it be? We would look at them and be like, that was the stupidest show ever. They they would come out and be like, ta-da, here it is. It's beautiful. No, it's not beautiful yet. Why? Because they're not finished working on it yet. And maybe you've come in here this morning. I want you to stand. Maybe you've come in this morning and you think your joy is missing. It's not missing. It's just mass. And and maybe you're going through something. You say, Pastor Matt, I don't see the good. And listen, but for you and I, if it's not good, like we sung earlier, then maybe he's not done yet. If we don't see the joy, then maybe he's not done yet. If we don't see the peace, maybe he's not done working. If we don't have the forgiveness, maybe he's not done yet. And so you know what our job is? It's to come back to our Heavenly Father and say, God, it's your keeping power that's going to make me stay here. It's your keeping power that's going to give me joy. Come on with your hands raised all over this place. Come on with your hands raised all over this place. Come on right there in your seat. Come on right there in your seat. I want you to begin to talk to God. God, thank you for your word this morning. God, thank you for your son, Jesus. Through him, we have salvation. God, that's where our inheritance is is accessible. God, through your son, Jesus, we have an inheritance. We have a lively hope. But God, thank you for your keeping power. And so, God, this morning, my joy is not missing. It's just been mass. So, Holy Spirit, right now, begin to come and pull the weeds. Holy Spirit, right now, begin to come and sandblast those rusty spots in my life. And, God, I'm going to stay in your presence. God, I'm going to stay in your goodness. God, I'm going to stay in your working power. God, because you're bringing joy. God, you're sealing it in my life. God, you're bringing peace. You're sealing it in my life in spite of what I see, in spite of circumstances. God, you are working today. God, there is joy. Come on, declare it over your life today. 
God, there is joy that you are working. God, there is joy that you are moving. So God, this morning we stay in your presence. God, this morning we stay in you. God, that you are renewing us today. God, you are keeping us this morning. God, you're keeping power as it work. Come on, declare it over your life. Come on, declare it over. God, there's joy. Joy is coming in our lives this morning. God, do your work today. Come on, declare that over your situation. Declare that over your circumstances. God, you're working. You're still moving. Listen, before we get out of here this morning, if that's you this morning, you say, Pastor Matt, that's me. Maybe I walked in this morning. It's not missing, but it's mass. And I want you to pray with me. Come on, hands are raised. Hands are raised right there. Come on, that's, come on, hands are going up. I want you to do me a favor this morning because we got a few more minutes. As a sign of faith, would you step out of your seat and come join me? You raise your hand. Come on, worship team, sing. You said that was me today. Come on, as a sign of faith, can you step out and say, God, I'm coming to you this morning to work. Holy Spirit, I'm coming to you to work. Come on. Other hands all over this place. Come, we're going to wait. Come on, worship in your seats as they come. Come on, altar workers, come, begin to pray. Come on, right in your seats, you begin to pray for your family. Begin to pray for those who are coming. There will be joy in the morning. If it's not good, then it's not good. No, it's not good with me. If it's not good, then it's not good. No, it's not good with me. If it's not good, then it's not good. No, it's not good with me. There will be joy in the morning. If there will be joy. glad we got a good God. Come on, how many of you are glad we got a good God this morning? The hardest thing to do is to not remove yourself when he's working. That's the hardest thing to do. When he's doing his restoration, you immediately just want to run out and say, let me show everybody. And God says, I'm not done yet, though. I'm not done yet. So listen, as we go this week, Come on, grab somebody by the hand. Put your hand on the shoulder if you're comfortable doing this. God, every person up here in the front, God, even those in the seat, God, thank you for your word this morning. God, thank you that we can have grace-filled joy. God, even during this holiday season, God, as we, Lord, for some it's a joyous time, for some it's not. God, maybe there are some family members that are missing that were there last year. But God, I pray that this holiday season would be a joy-filled time. God, as we go to our campuses, as we go to our jobs, God, let us be people that the outward expression is because of what you're doing on the inside. 
And God, I pray, Lord, in spite of circumstances, in spite of situations and trials and tribulations that we may face, thank you for your keeping power. And God, I pray that this week, Psalms 51:12, that you would restore unto us the joy of our salvation. That we will walk out this week, Lord, let your hand be upon us at every location, God. Let your hand be upon us as we walk out this week, Lord, not so that we get the attention or we get the glory, but God, so that you get the glory and you get the attention. God, and I pray, Lord, you keep us safe. Lord, you bring us back safe next week, God, that we experience a grace-filled, joyful life. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.